So let's get started. So it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, uh, Chris Bennett. He has uh, industry experience for over 20 years in the entertainment software industry, and he has worked with and for a number of companies, to name a few, Play First, Digital Chocolate, and uh, Electronic Arts. And he's worked as a game designer, as producer, and also as consultant. And one of the titles, more recent ones, that he is uh, very proud of is Dino Dash, which is one of the most uh, downloaded games uh, of our times now. And we had a pretty significant role, as he may tell you. Um, during the more recent years, he actually splits his time half and half between industry and academia. So he has been affiliated uh, with Stanford now as a game designer and residence. And he's giving lectures as of today. And what he's going to talk today about is more about board games because he feels that board games remove a bunch of the technology, uh, some of the constraints, and make it more accessible, uh, kind of the game mechanics, especially in an educational context. So welcome, Chris. Thank you. I'm going to talk to you about a story about a game designer who got himself out of trouble using board games. But first, a little bit about me. Um, like Ingmar gave me a great introduction. I've spent about 20 years mostly in the digital game space, um, designing, producing, developing, even, even testing games. <clears throat> and it's been interesting to observe the changes that have been happening in the digital game industry since then, because when I first started, we were taking a real turn from, from cartridge-based games to CD-ROM-based games. And then we started moving from CD-ROM-based games to DVD and then to online. And now it seems kind of weird to buy a game in a store because you're just going to download it to your Xbox. You're going to download it to your PC or your phone. At the same time, when I first started in the game industry, playing games online was, wasn't really something that you did on purpose because it was pretty painful. As the technology has gotten better and high-speed internet has gotten to be an everyday thing, we kind of assume that we can play whatever we want, whenever we want, with whomever we want. But I've observed that that's led to a little bit of weariness around some of the tech. And we've been seeing a lot of uh, analog coming back in a lot of ways. People wanting to be in front of each other to play a game or to watch a movie or to listen to records rather than listening to a CD or listening to Pandora or Spotify. <clears throat> and we've had a real resurgence in analog games as well. The 20 years ago, there was um, the concept of, of you're playing uh, Monopoly. Who here has never played Monopoly before? Has anyone never played Monopoly before? Has anyone never played Settlers of Catan before? Okay, a couple people haven't. <clears throat> before Settlers of Catan came around, it was kind of assumed that if you're going to play a game, you're going to play kind of an American-style game like Monopoly, or you're going to play Yahtzee, or you're going to play Apples to Apples. And American-style games tended to be, games with simple rules tended to be pretty simplistic. Games with more complicated rules tended to be deep. Those are the kind of games where you're going to sit down and play a war game or play a strategic game with someone for four or five or six hours. And in 1995, Settlers of Catan came out, and it was known as the first game of, the, of what was called the Euro Wave. And the wave of Euro games was different because you're bringing in mostly a German influence, and a lot of German families would sit together in the evenings and play games together. They wouldn't watch cable, or they wouldn't all sit on the internet or sit on their separate tablets. They would actually play games together. So you're getting games that can be played by a whole family together. You have games that have simple rules. You have games that are easy to play and that are approachable. But it tends away from the uh, American style of a lot of the competition is head on. I got to knock this person out of the game. I have to defeat this person. Uh, Euro style games were played to win, but some of the competition was sometimes indirect. I didn't have to knock you out in order to win the game. And we are also seeing a little bit of uh, cooperative games, which is something that in American style games we didn't really see at all. Um, and let's take a moment to talk about what tabletop is. <clears throat> tabletop, uh, to me, are games that are meant to be played around a table with people in real time. Uh, you might have board games, you might have dice games and card games. Um, a little out of the scope of uh, my talk today, but role-playing games like Dungeons and Dragons and everything that's come in the 40 years after that uh, is meant to be played. And then when you start to delve into things like live-action role-playing games where you're playing a character and you're getting up and moving around, that gets you away from the table and gets you a little bit away from the world of tabletop games. 
So what has happened more recently in tabletop games, now that we're 20 years past Settlers of Catan, and every year there's a, there's a Spiel de Jahr that comes out in, in Germany. It's a very influential award. Uh, and people are fighting for this award. Games are starting to sell 10,000, 50,000, even 100,000 copies, which is something that didn't really happen in the past. Now we're starting to see the, the Euro style combining with more of the American or the, or the North American style. And we have games that are still relatively simple. Most of the core rules can go on to two, three, four, maybe six pages. But we're starting to see some real complexity around the rules. Um, skill has almost been, excuse me, skill has been maximized enough in these games that, that dice and, and the luck factor has almost been removed from it. People want to play head to head and have a fun experience, but they don't want to say, oh, well, that person won because <clears throat> he rolled the dice good or she had a bad run of luck and so she, she didn't win. It's really around your skill and how good you can play. Uh, we're also seeing the complexity of, of, of the rules and mechanics working together in such a way. I compare it a lot to, uh, to systems thinking because these games are interlocking sets of, uh, of gears that all work together and we're starting to see games that 10 years ago would have been on a board and people have gotten rid of the board and just put them on the cards. Um, so the, most of the rules are on the cards, the currency is on the cards, the, uh, the play set is on the cards. So in the spring of 2014, uh, I had the, the great opportunity to guest lecture inside of a collective action course here at the Center for Ethics with Mark Badolfson, who uh, was a postdoc there at the time. And he gave me two course weeks of his collective action course to teach his students, and these were undergrad and, and graduate level students, to design tabletop games to teach middle and high schoolers the basics of collective action. And <clears throat> we talked about this a lot, and after I agreed to it, I realized that bringing digital games into this class and basically having four class periods to do this was a non-starter. Technology is with us all the time, but if I bring it into the classroom there, I'm gonna spend half of my time that I've been allotted for game design showing them how to use this piece of software, making sure that we have all the iPads, making sure that we have all the laptops, um, making sure that they have time to debug their code, when in fact I want to spend all of that time working on the mechanics and working on the experience and making sure they have ample time to play test it, not only along with each other but with others. <clears throat> So what we did is we spent some time showing them that collective action could be modeled in a game. So we talked about things like the, the tragedy of the commons and overfishing and how we can do exercises around that. Uh, and then I took them through the, the basics of design, uh, which is to understand your audience, that you need to brainstorm um, your ideas and get a lot of ideas out, that you need to prototype these ideas and actually get them on paper or in this case get them out on cards or get them out on a board and start playing with those ideas and see what works and see what doesn't work. Uh, that's the point where the rubber meets the road and you quickly realize whether something's working or not. But then you get into a challenging part where you're testing it and you're giving your game to someone else. Hopefully so, an easy audience first. You give it to your peers and you see whether they like it or not, but you listen very closely to, to their feedback. Uh, and also get feedback on, am I using the collective action principles right and correctly, or did I just create a game that just has some, some flavor to it? Uh, <clears throat> in their case, we actually did some blind play testing, which, you, which I think is even much more um, compelling but much more difficult to do because Mark and I took their games and brought them to actual middle and high schools. We, we brought them to, uh, to Girls Inc. of the Island City and we brought them to Castilea School here in Palo Alto and put them in front of people to play these games. And so now you get playtest feedback that is uh, sometimes not what you're expecting. And this forces you to go back and iterate on your designs and then for the final products, they polished them and had presentations where we brought people in to watch these presentations and they were really good. And they learned a whole lot about them. And when the, when the course was over, uh, we asked the students for feedback on what did you learn from designing this course? Um, what are some principles of designing for collective action? And it was interesting, um, I got back a flood of really interesting data 
but it all started to bucket into four main categories. Um, a lot of it did. And I'll go through a couple of those. One, and some of these seem obvious at first, but when you start designing uh, an actual game for an actual purpose, sometimes it's not so obvious. Don't assume anything about your audience. Don't assume that just because someone is 13 years old that they won't know about this. Don't assume that because someone is 30 years old that they'll actually bother to read your rules. Uh, another good one, keep it simple, less is more. I always tell people, once you've gotten your rules down, find ways to eliminate rules. It's like, it's like tight writing, like someone like Hem uh, Hemingway. Remove words, remove sentences wherever you can, because the less words that are in your rules, the more apt people are going to be to read and understand the ones that you really want them to see. Another one <clears throat> is that testing your ideas is critical, uh, especially blind testing your ideas. There are a lot of games that get made and they get showed off to friends and family and you get that great feedback of, this is a great game, I really liked it. And I learned early on that as much as I love my mom, I don't trust her when it comes to, to, to good feedback about my games. I need to put it in front of someone who, who hasn't raised me um, to get honest feedback about it. And actually, getting one great thing about getting blind feedback is that it's not you. When I put the game in front of someone, I can honestly say, this isn't my game. So whatever you say isn't going to bother me at all. Um, that's when you start to get real feedback on, well, you know, I wish that this was different and I really didn't understand what was going on with this, with this interaction. And the last one's very important, be prepared to change what doesn't work. We get really excited about our ideas, um, as we should be. We should have a lot of passion around our ideas. But when you run up against that brick wall, you have two choices. You can either stand there, or you can beat your head against a brick wall, or you can walk around it. And I encourage people to look at the wall and walk around it and find a different way. <clears throat> One of the best quotes that I got from the feedback, I wanted to read in its entirety, uh, was at the, end of a day, at the end of the day, a simple delivery of information and concepts is what makes a majority of people act on something that's complicated. <clears throat> so I want to talk a little bit about what games give us uh, when we sit down and play a game. And this is true for digital games as well, but especially for analog games when we're sitting together and we're immersing ourselves with a group of people with all the social cues that happen around that. There's the experience. We get a chance to experience new things. Uh, if I play a game about farming, I don't necessarily experience a simulation of what farming is like, but you can get some of that flavor around a cleverly designed game. There's the extension. You get a chance to go deep with the, uh, uh, with the subject matter. Sometimes when you play a game, a, a, a well-designed game the first time, you get it and you go, okay, I played that game, I get it. I, I won or lost, but I get it. Some games you play it and say, I wanna play the game again, because I got the basics of it, but I don't really understand the intricacies of it. And sometimes you play a game for the 14th time and you learn something that you didn't know the 13th time. That's something that we don't often do with other types of media. It's not that often, unless it's Star Wars, that I would watch a movie the 14th time. Uh, it's not often that I would read a book the 14th time, unless it really was a seminal work um, or, or a TV show or what have you. But a game, especially a game that can be played in 45 minutes, over the course of several years, I might play that game 14 times and start to learn different things and learn the play patterns of the people that are at that table and I've played games a dozen times and then brought them to someone else and sat down and played it and say, they just play that game completely differently than anyone I know. What can I learn from that observation? <clears throat> There's also the emotion that goes around games. What am I feeling at the table? Uh, am I feeling excited because I think that I'm gonna win? Am I feeling a little bit worried that this person is a couple moves ahead of me and is really outthinking me right now and how is that gonna make me change? <clears throat> Am I just feeling that, that social fun because I'm around people that I know and love? Or uh, I play a lot of games with people that I don't know. So I'll sit down at the table with people that I don't know and there's that emotion and socialization that comes around that. Another one is engagement. Uh, I'll talk about this later when we talk about games and education. Games are not meant to be a substitute for lectures or books 
or videos or doing exercises, but it comes with a different level of engagement. <clears throat> Sitting down and reading a seminal work or listening to a, a lecture um, is engaging in a different way than a game is. Some games make you think the whole time, even when someone else is going, you're thinking about your move, you're thinking three moves ahead what's gonna happen. Some games <clears throat> that are intense during your move, you get a little bit of a break while the other people are moving. And in good games, those breaks and those beats are designed into the game on purpose. So knowing that you're going to have uh, a little bit of a period of intensity, but you have to watch what comes around. Another one is empathy. <clears throat> you can experience empathy when playing a game with the people that you're playing with, and sometimes with the, the, the people or peoples who might be represented in a game. Um, you play a game that's about another period of time, and you can think about and imagine what it might have been like in a different way than you might when you're watching a, a movie about that or reading a book about it. <clears throat> and now I want to talk a little bit about what we can learn from playing and designing games. Uh, as I've already talked about, there's a socialization around it, which is tabletop games put you around a table with people who you know, who you don't know, who you trust, you don't trust, who you love, who you vaguely dislike. All those things are important, all those things come into play, they're another rule in the game. When I know that this person is always going to try to block me, that becomes another rule in the game that I find fascinating. There's the critical thinking that happens when you're playing and especially designing games. Um, you're really needing to think about the rules and the play experience from different angles. Of course, there's the math of the game. Um, games have become increasingly complex with the economies that are in there, and you could do a whole lecture on the economies around games and <clears throat> where the points are coming from and what your meeples are doing at any given moment and how much wheat or stone that you have. All this is math that you're keeping in your head, and it's simple math, but it's interesting in an engaging way in the same way that, that word problems can be interesting when you're, when you're doing basic math and doing the formulas is a different type of thinking. Sometimes in games we have ethical choices. Uh, there's a game that I played recently that's about the, uh, the, the slave trade in the 1800s. And you're playing people who are trying to get slaves from the south up north. And they're ethical choices because you realize that in order to get these people up to Canada, you might have to sacrifice this person over here. It can cause an interesting discussion after the game around that. I played another game recently that was about um, French soldiers in, in World War I, and they were trying to survive another night in the trenches. And the choices that they made, and what, what that game was really bringing out was the bonds between the soldiers and some of the weaknesses that they encountered. And we actually had a good discussion afterwards about, about what that meant. What, would this game have played any differently if, if we were playing German soldiers? or American or British soldiers rather than French. Uh, we start to think about some of our own biases and some of the ethical choices around there. <clears throat> of course, games can be about competition and teach us what it means to compete, what it means to, to win. Are we directly competing with someone? Are we trying to knock that person out of the game? Uh, or are we both reaching for the goal at the same time, like runners in a race? You don't have to boot the other person out of the race to, to win. You just need to get to the finish line before they do. Euro games do that really well <clears throat> and do it in a compelling way where there's a winner and a loser at the end of the game. Uh, but sometimes there's even several sets of winners where you can see one person's won by points, one person has won by resources, and one person has won by, by some other factor there. Games can also teach you about cooperation. One game, or one game mechanic that we haven't seen much until recently are games that are actually cooperative, where you have four people sitting around a table and you're cooperating with each other to win this game. And I find that fascinating because I think 10 or 20 or especially 30 years ago, we would say, well, why are we playing this game to compete with each other? Why are we sitting down at this table? We didn't play poker to, to help each other get a better hand. We didn't play Yahtzee so I could give you some of my dice. But people are starting to work those in and see a difference in the social and empathetic mentality of sitting down and playing one of those games. 
Um, people have put clever rules into their games so there's a little bit of cooperation and also a little bit of competition. There's a game I played recently where I was fascinated to see that in the rules of the game, if you changed two or three sentences, which they did, you could, it would switch from being a completely competitive game to a completely cooperative game with two or three sentences into the whole rules. That to me is, is smart gameplay and giving you a chance to play inside of a wider world. And there's also the chance for storytelling and not just storytelling in the way of role playing games or live action role playing games where I, I, I have a sword and I'm fighting dragons. There's storytelling that happens inside of these games where the cards or boards are representative of different, of different things and we have a chance to, to tell the story through the characters that we're playing or through the, the things that we're moving around the board. The scalability of stories is interesting to me. Uh, last year there was a game that came out uh, about Lewis and Clark Expedition and I played it and it was a good game. It's just kind of long for, for kind of my family situation. I don't often have a couple hours to sit down and play a game. So this past year they put out a smaller version of the game that keeps about 70% of what was interesting about that game, um, but it probably takes half the time in order to play it. But what I found is, is that it tells a slightly different take on the story. And now I'm interested to go out and see, is there a card game or maybe a dice game that, that deals with Lewis and Clark but you could sit down and play it in 20 or 30 minutes? And what kind of story would that tell? <clears throat> Margarita and I were talking about this uh, the other day that, that playing games gets you to the heart of the matter. It gets you uh, right to the core of what it is that you're experiencing. But when you design games, that allows you to be a heart surgeon because you get to go in there and move everything around and put it where you want, hopefully better. So why are tabletop games useful for education? I've been thinking about a lot about this lately. Uh, Marguerite and I actually helped run a, a workshop for the Learning Design and Technology program at the Graduate School of Education. And these were all uh, students who were in the LDT master's program and we spent a day teaching them how to think like game designers. And that caused us to reflect a lot on what, on what that is like. The paper prototyping process alone teaches you critical thinking because you're having to, to move these pieces around. You're not simply um, talking about lines of code. You're not talking about a text file. You're talking about actually cutting these things out and figuring out how they're gonna move and interact together and think about how the, the player is going to interface with them. A big one for me is that there's a low barrier to adoption. There is no technology involved. Uh, of course, you can take any paper prototype and scale it up. If you design a game and you, and you play it and you like it and you want to make it into an app or you want it to be on your PC or your Mac, you can do that. The scalability from analog to digital is always there, but you're not limited at the beginning when you start, which is why I always encourage people to try to start with, with paper, because that's typically how I start designing. Um, there's no code involved. You don't need coders. You don't need to learn a particular language in order to do this. You just literally need some cardboard and some dice and some markers and start prototyping. Get your idea on the board as quickly as possible so you can put it in front of people and get feedback from them. Using games in the classroom allows you to, to model systems thinking. Uh, the basics of sim systems thinking is that everything is, is interconnected and it's a series of gears that moves around. And when you really start to deconstruct analog tabletop games, you realize that it very much is a system. And when you start hacking games or changing games around, you quickly learn which pieces of the game you can change which will not affect the core of the system and which pieces of the game that if you touch are going to significantly change the, uh, the core of the system. And in a little bit, I'll talk about the core loop and we'll delve in more to about what the core of a game or experience is really like. It also models the iterative design process. Uh, we talked about that earlier with what we did in the uh, collective action course of going through all the cycle, the cycle of design and making sure that you're thinking about all those different areas. One of the big important things to me is that analog opens up the funnel of who can be a designer. Um, in the past 10 years, I think, game design schools have become much, much bigger than they were, certainly when I was coming up through the ranks. 
But what I've seen from a lot of game design schools is that most of them are, co or a lot of them are around coding, and a lot of them are around 3D modeling for art. Um, sometimes I talk to people who are coming out of game school and they never really learn how to design a game. They learn how to develop a game, they learn some awesome tools and, and some awesome ways to get their vision onto a computer screen somewhere, but do they really learn the ins and outs of what a compelling experience is like? Um, sometimes when I talk to people that have gone through a year or two of this, I get blank faces when I talk about emotion and chemistry and empathy and uh, even some of the simple things around the interconnectedness of some of the mechanics in the game, um, which I think is a missed opportunity. I think we could be doing more starting with tabletop. To me, education is about impact. Um, it's our obligation to, to package this teaching that we have in such a way that we can meet people where they are and they can utilize it in a way to, to move what it is that they're doing forward. And as I've said before, games are not a replacement for books or for lectures or for, uh, for videos or, or papers, but they can be an enhancement. One thing that I've been thinking about lately is in, in bringing new items to, to teachers whether it's at the university level or the K through 12 level, is the fact that teachers are incredibly busy and incredibly overloaded. And you're giving me a new tool that I have to learn and you're giving me a new thing that I have to teach inside of a class. So uh, what we've been thinking about are what sorts of tools and what sorts of ideas can we help bring to teachers to bring inside a class that complement what they're already doing. So instead of saying, well, we're gonna go off and, and we're gonna teach your, your kids how to play Minecraft, which is something that gets used a lot in K-12 right now, and it is a great game and a great technology, um, but it's kind of its own thing. It's, it's kind of hard sometimes to teach Greek history inside of Minecraft, although, strangely enough, it's not impossible. Uh, if you can teach electricity inside of Minecraft, I'm sure you could teach Greek history inside of it. Um, but, I like the process of, uh, of bringing games in and having students deconstruct them and learn what makes them tick and then use those parts to create their own games using the subject matter that they're already learning inside of the class. That is something that I'm really interested in pursuing. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, what's called a core loop. A core loop is something that we use inside of, uh, of games a lot. <clears throat> and a core loop is basically defined as a three to five repeatable steps that someone's doing over and over inside of a game or some sort of interactive experience. And I'll talk about some, some basic ones, although there are always exceptions. And the goal of the core loop is to get people into a cycle that they'll want to continue on with. <clears throat> Who here has ever played uh, Angry Birds before? It's okay, you can admit to it. Uh, <clears throat> so Angry Birds is a great example of a core loop, even though it's a, it's a digital game. Uh, when you play, when you, when you get your next bird, you're observing what's going on. With these, with these pigs and what it is that they're doing to you because they're, they're bad pigs. And you get to observe the situation because every level is like a puzzle. Um, you decide on your course of action. Uh, in that case, you're already, given the, uh, uh, you're already given the bird that you're gonna use, but you decide, is this a bird that's gonna drop an, an exploding egg? Is this a bird that's gonna go really fast? What angle do I wanna go? How far do I wanna pull this back? The same thought process goes through when you're, when you're playing a game like Settlers of Catan. Do I want to trade wheat for stone? Do I want to try and stymie this person? What, what's kind of what's my end game? At some point, you act, which in the case of Angry Birds, you pull back the meter and you let go and this bird goes, this poor bird goes flying into all the crates and the, uh, and you watch what's happening. And in Angry Birds, the watching is part of the reward because you see all the crates tumbling. You see your birds going free. You see the piggies freaking out. 
Um, but the interesting thing is, in that particular game, if you haven't finished the uh, if you haven't finished the level yet, and you have the audio on, the pigs will start going, <laughs> and it's your audio cue that you haven't quite won yet. Uh, this is true in tabletop games as well. You'll go through and you'll make a masterful move and you'll get your reward, but if maybe that's gotten you close to the end game and maybe now I have 12 victory points and Ingmar has nine and I feel pretty good, but now I need to wait and see what's gonna happen because maybe he's gonna knock out four victory points in his next turn. It's that give and take that's, that's interesting here. And what we're looking for in core loops is how can we speed these things up? <clears throat> when we're talking about using games in education, there's also the possibility of using core loops, uh, finding ways to slow core loops down. Uh, in a, uh, some research work that Margarita and I did several years ago, we were looking at uh, why Sikh Americans were being targeted for hate crimes and why this was happening. And so what we did was actually develop the core loop of hate crimes and why they occur and why people are getting rewarded for it and why they continue and people start to look at it and say well can I drive a stake through here and stop part two from going to part three um, and I think that would be useful for for design a game around can we design a game that has mechanics in it but we're trying to find ways to stop this thing from happening um, there's some really good games uh, in the kind of board game slash light board game space by a designer named Volko Runke. Um, he's developed a line of uh, coin games, uh, counterinsurgency, where he's talking about a lot of the, the kind of guerrilla and small conflicts that have gone on in the world, but some of them they're involving uh, the U.S., other coalitions. And when you set up and play those games, I could set up and, 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 and demo this game for you, and before you even play the first turn, you're gonna look at that and go, the US is in a really bad core loop in Afghanistan. Every time they step out of one of the big cities, they're gonna get smacked. And they don't have the capabilities to really go out into the countryside where the warlords are. And you see it just by laying the game out. You haven't even played the game yet. Um, so that's an area that I'm interested in exploring as well. Another thing that I use in design is called a compulsion analysis. And this is taking more of a long-term view at a game experience. What am I doing, not only in my core loop, but how am I extending, extending this out? And we can think about this in terms of if you're playing a game that's ongoing, or if you're playing a game over and over again, and you want to keep people interested in it. So if you're playing a game in a 10-week course, or in a K through 12 uh, um, class that's going to last for a quarter or a semester, how are you keeping the students interested in the education that's going on? So in this corner, we have the core loop. What are you doing over and over again? So up here, we have the core loop. What is it that you're doing again and again in your experience? Here we have the minute to minute. Uh, as you're going through a class period or as you're playing a game, what are you doing again and again? In the case of uh, a game like poker, you're having a hand is what you're gonna do minute to minute. And you're, when you're playing a game like, uh, like Angry Birds, how many levels are you getting through in the game? Are you actually getting to another world? A critical part is what happens at the end of your first experience, and what happens at the start of your, of your second experience. Because this, in a lot of digital, real-world tabletop, this is where it breaks. You can get people to try a lot of things the first time, but do they tune out? Uh, in the educational space, they may need to come to class the next time, but are they engaged in what happened? Are they just doing it because they need to? Uh, in the case of, uh, of an app, um, 
40% of iPhone apps are never used a second time. 13% of them are never even opened the first time. So you never even got a chance to engage with them. <clears throat> this is a key part. What do you want them to experience at the end of the first session? And why is it they're coming back again? This is probably the key of the, the compulsion analysis. And once you get them past this, you say, oh, OK, well, you, you used Amazon, and you made your order. And now you're curious because they want to see when their order shows up. If you could think way, way back the first time you ever used Amazon, before Prime was a thing and before they were showing you movies, you're waiting for it to come in. And then you think about how are you engaging people in the weeks and months ahead. Um, in the weeks ahead, you're starting to get into progression systems. Um, why are people playing this game over and over again? Um, are you bringing new things to bear? Are you, if you're playing a board game, are there new uh, add-ons that they can play? Are there advanced rules that they can play? Can they play with different groups of people? Uh, in a digital game, a lot of times there's downloadable content that people can, can grab and play. <clears throat> and then in the months ahead, someone like Amazon has gotten this to a literal science where they know once you've got, once you've got into the compulsion analysis, they're going to start to throw things at you now, like Amazon Prime. You can get it in two days. You can get it in a day. I'm, we're weeks away from my house being able to get a, a cat litter, even though I don't have a cat, in one hour. I'm going to start to look for the drones flying over my house to see when the cat litter is going to appear for the cat that I don't have. Um, so they've gotten this down. They, I, I keep my Amazon Prime because my daughter watches cartoons on Amazon Video, and I listen to the music sometimes, besides the fact that I, uh, I, I save on the shipping of that. So we need to think about this for our experiences. If you are teaching a course or you're using some game or game-like activities in there, um, people are coming back, but they're going to start to get bored after a while because they're gonna, literally going to run out of content. Are you going to continue creating content all the time? Um, or are you going to develop a community or, or an elder game around it? And this is, especially when you start to get into um, courses or coursework that start to go year after year, how can you bring people back? You had someone who was in a course several years ago and you bring them back to guest lecture. That's a really nice way of, of bringing that back in. Are there any questions around the core loop or the compulsion analysis? Yes. So um, the core loop, if you, um, like when we think about education, um, right now, uh, absent of thinking about you know, how I would design it as a game designer, you know, there, there are lectures, and then there's a midterm, and then you get your grade at some point, mm -hmm. or, you know, or you do your final, and then you know, a week or two later you get the grade, and so on. Mm -hmm. um, it seems like with, with one of the things that gets you hooked in games is that you get this this, this reward, this feedback, how am I doing, how am I doing, how am I doing? And in education, we tend not to have that. The feedback loop is really broad. So by the time that you've learned how you're doing on, on calculus, you've moved on. You know, right. Like, oh, yeah, I, I really didn't get that unit. <laughs> right. But now you're, th you know, you're three, three units beyond that. Right. Um, how would, you know, what are the notions around using the core loop to help tune how we create educational experiences? That's a good question. I think I would step away a little bit from, from core loops to help tune that and start to think about rewards and, and economies. Um, if you've done any studying of rewards, there's the concept of extrinsic rewards, which are when you get a badge for something, when you get a grade for something, when you get a, uh, when my daughter gets uh, to watch some, some cartoons because she took a nap that day. Uh, these are extrinsic rewards. Those things tend to, to run out pretty quickly because people start realizing, I get a piece of candy every time I'm good. That's great. Are you going to start giving me more candy? Are you going to start eventually giving me like a pile of candy when I do something good? There's also the concept of intrinsic rewards, which are you feel good inside for doing it. Um, and that gets to that point very directly because uh, nowadays people do have higher expectations around, I want to get rewards quicker. I want to get feedback about how I'm doing in my course quicker. I don't want to wait until I take the quiz on Tuesday 
and the instructor doesn't have a chance to grade it until Friday, and then I don't really find out until Monday, and now I'm a week behind if I find that I'm doing bad. <clears throat> I think we could do a better job of finding ways inside of courses in education of giving people the reward right then. They may need to find out how they did on the quiz, um, but finding ways to give more implicit rewards, um, giving them a chance to share with their peers in class, um, giving them a chance to get some, some recognition on what they've done, the fact that they've uh, at least tried to, uh, try to achieve this. There's a lot of more wor work that we could be doing with that. Um, in a little bit of time that I have left, I want to talk about some of the, about some of the techniques that, that people are using. Um, Nicole Azaro is probably the foremost expert in the world on um, fun and emotion inside of games. And she's done some great, great work on, the, on what she calls the keys of fun. And I'm going to go through the, the four keys of fun right now. And because I first met her because she was consulting with when I was working on the, the Diner Dash franchise of sitting down with us and saying, this game is good. How can we make it better? This experience is good. How can we make it tighter? This emotion is fun. How can we make it more emotion? How can we make, how can we make the system tighter? And she talks about hard fun, um, which is when you're trying to get through that level in Candy Crush Saga and you just keep getting bonked. You keep bonking your head against it and then you finally achieve it and you get that, yes, I finally made it. That's the concept of what she calls Fiero, which is hard fun. There's the, the concept of easy fun, which is curiosity. And easy fun is sometimes you, uh, you're playing Super Mario Brothers and you reach a little secret area and all you're doing is jumping and grabbing those stars. That's all you're doing is grabbing those things. Or you're playing Sonic and you're grabbing the rings. Uh, there's nothing really to it. It's kind of a simple reward system, but it's fun. It just allows you to kind of just relax and do your thing. There's a concept of serious fun, uh, which has a little bit of relaxation and but a little bit of excitement in it and we observed this recently when we were doing the workshop for the learning design technology students and that at the very beginning of the day we had them play uh, board and card games we had them play tabletop games and it all looked very fun and frivolous and they were having a lot of fun and then in the morning i taught them some of the the basics of how to deconstruct games how we talk about games how we think about games how we think about a game designer and after lunch, we had them switch games and play them again. And we watched them and thought, God, these people are really serious. Did they have too much for lunch? Or is it just tiring? Or, or what's going on? And so we asked them, and the response that I got was, well, before we were just playing the games, but now you taught us how to play them and how to think about the games and how to take them more seriously, and we did. So you got more of that serious fun of we're actually really paying attention to the experience that we have and not just trying to beat the other person. The other key of fun that she talks about is people fun. <clears throat> and that's the curiosity and that's something that you really, really get from tabletop games that sometimes we don't get from video games. Even if we're playing a 64 player game where everyone's online in different parts of the world, you have that technology and you have that space separation. But when you're sitting together with four people around a table, it's difficult to ignore the fact that you're sitting around a table with four people. There's a certain amount of people fun that happens there. And one more thing before we're done is uh, how do games affect your brain? Um, I'm really interested and want to learn more about the process of playing games and how it affects uh, the neurology, how it affects the chemicals, how even it affects the neuroplasticity of our brains. Um, my brother works for the Center for Brain Health in, in Dallas and part of me wants to go to a place like that and hook people up and watch what's going on in their brains as they're playing a game. When someone makes a move and they're like, oh, and they want to take it back and everyone's looking at them like, you took your hand off the piece, man. You're, you can't take it back now. What, what happens in the brain of the player when that happens? What happens in the brain of, of someone when they're about to do something and they suddenly realize that there's a better move, that they have a game breaker. What happens? What happens in, in, the, in the mind of a gamer when they feel like they're doing pretty good and then they're slowly coming to the realization that they're just not gonna win the game? Sometimes in a 15 minute game, it's not a big deal. If you sat down and you've been playing this game for three hours and you're really invested in it, uh, 
there's that feeling of dread, like, oh, I gotta play this game out, but I just know I'm gonna lose. What's actually happening in our brains? Um, we do know that there are some chemical changes that happen when you're playing games along with any other experience. There's, there's the dopamine that comes from, from more attention, more rewards. I'm getting that dopamine hit. There's the oxytocin, which I call the, uh, the, the baby chemical. When you're holding babies or you're getting a hug from someone, it's that bonding chemical. And you get that happen a lot in games, especially with people that you know or with people that you don't know, and you suddenly realize that, you know what, I'm kind of okay spending 45 minutes around a table with these people playing a game. I didn't know them before, but we have something in common, and they're kind of cool. It's an interesting bonding experience that creates chemical changes. And the last one are endorphins, which are not only inhibit pains, but give you that feeling of euphoria. Uh, um, Huizinga has something that he, uh, in a, some older works that he calls the magic circle. And the magic circle is kind of this <clears throat> semi-permeable circle, but when we push it and we go inside of it and we decide to inhabit it, we're willing to accept that things are not as they are in the real world. So if I sit down at my computer and I play Farmville uh, on Facebook for a while, I'm stepping into the magic circle and I'm accepting the fact that real farming isn't really like that. I don't have to get up at 4 a.m. Um, to do this. I can simply go in there and go to my friend's farms and I can wave my magic wand and have these fun things happen. Um, and I'm willing to do that because I'm playing a game. Um, <clears throat> when I sit down with someone and uh, I play a game at, at the tabletop, I'm willing to accept that the rules of the game are the rules of the game and they're not the rules of the real world. Mm -hmm.